everyone, welcome again. So today's lesson will start the first of our series on sh shipwrecks and salvage. So this is one of the options for the HSC chemistry syllabus. And so we'll be looking at corrosion, um, electrochemistry, and how it relates to um, marine applications like ships and how it affects shipwrecks um, that are deep below the ocean. So today's lesson will focus on the ocean as an electrolyte. So in previous uh, topics, we've studied what an electrolyte is, and we're going to look at the ocean's properties in terms of how it acts as an electrolyte. So here we have Parade, a very um, common electrolyte, or it's advertised as having electrolytes and various other things in it. And so similarly, the ocean water is an electrolyte, but uh, not quite the same comp composition as Powerade. So ocean minerals. So we know that when we ha when we take a you know a jar full of ocean water, it's full of different ions. So particularly salt, so sodium chloride. So because there's so many ions in it, it makes ocean water a particularly strong electrolyte. So if we were to conduct electricity through it, um, it would have a much greater current than say a dilute solution of sodium chloride. So it's quite concentrated for a natural substance. So obviously, because it has ions flowing, or ions all scattered through it, it can conduct electricity much better than fresh water. So fresh water has a very low conductivity of electricity, uh, which is surprising because most people say, you know, don't stand in the water, you know, lightning storms and things. But it's because it has no ions compared to salt water, um, and because there's no ions, it can't conduct electricity. So in the ocean, we see mostly sodium chloride, the salt that we eat, table salt. But there are other ions that exist uh, in the ocean, but they're at much lower concentrations. So if we look at this table, you can see that the relative abundance as a percentage, chloride is the highest. Over half of the ions in the water are chloride ions. Sodium comes in at 30, about 30.6%. And then you can see less than 10% for the remaining ones. Are, and these are still the most major um, components. So you see sulfate is almost 8%. Magnesium is almost 4%. Calcium is just over 1%. And, and potassium is also just over 1%. So you can see probably around 86 almost percent is sodium chloride and the rest is, the, is these other ions like sulfate, magnesium, calcium, and potassium. And here we have just the concentrations as a mole per liter. Okay? So you can see that it's much higher for these two compared to the rest of the ions that we find in the water. So the question then becomes, where do these salts actually come from? So if the water is, if there's so much water on the planet, there must be a very large percentage of ions that, coming, that are coming from somewhere to fill this ocean water with these sodium chloride and various other ions. So they come from a variety of sources, and we have one here, which is the hydrothermal vent. So firstly, one typical one that we see is groundwater. So when it rains, uh, it, the water seeps into the ground, and it dissolves ions in the soil. Um, and that what that does is it when the water uh, exits towards the ocean, it pulls all those ions with it, and then that adds to the ion concentration of the ocean. Um, besides that, we have hydrothermal vents, which is this picture here. You can see that the, there's like a spout of gas and other things coming out of it, and that contributes the remaining salt, and it's probably the biggest concentration. So hydrothermal vents are just simply uh, areas where there's a fissure in the, in the crust, and the water can actually get into or close to the molten magma in the mantle. So we'll look at leaching in, and groundwater in a little bit more depth now. So rain and groundwater from irrigation can dissolve compounds in rocks and soil to form salt solution. So as I mentioned, when it rains or when we put water into the soil for irrigation purposes, it dissolves the ions in the soil and that gives us a salt solution, obviously. Now, this water runs off 
because you know all water leads back to the ocean. Um, so it runs off and takes these dissolved salts with it. So when it rains and then it dissolves all those salts and then that water leaves to the ocean, it brings the salt with it and that adds to the salt concentration of the ocean. Um, this is a natural process, this happens even if we don't do anything, but it has been amplified by human um, activities like land clearing. So if you imagine a forest um, and it rains on the forest, so let's draw this, so you've got a tree, right, and it's got roots and here's the soil. So if it rains, the water that collects here might be absorbed by the tree. And so the salts don't escape into the, don't get dragged into the ocean because the water is being absorbed by the tree. Now, if you cut down that tree and it no longer absorbs water, then of course the salts can then move freely in the water and the water will take them to the ocean instead of being absorbed by that tree. So land clearing, so clearing of forests and things like that has contributed to this increase in groundwater leaching because the plants no longer absorb that water and give you and sort of hold the salts where they should be. So a more complicated mechanism for getting salts into the water is the hydrothermal vent. So mid-ocean ridges are sort of the meeting place of tectonic plates. Um, so they're the boundaries. And these ridges occur uh, will allow water to percolate into the fissures. So percolate just means to seep in sort of. So you can see here there might be a fissure through this rock and the water can actually seep into it, right? So the water gets into those, into those small spaces between the rocks. And because it's very close to the magma of the mantle, because it's like quite close, it heats up and the water becomes very, very hot, okay? Now, when you, you know that when you boil water, it's actually easier to dissolve sugar in it, right? You can dissolve more sugar in boil, boiling water than you can in cold water. So similarly, things that may not have dissolved at very low temperatures, you know, at the bottom of the ocean, it's quite cold. So the salts that may not have dissolved at those low temperatures are now soluble because it's, the water is very, very hot because of this magma. So this allows the water to become mineralized when it comes in contact with all these rocks, right? So the minerals in the rocks that wouldn't have dissolved in cold water are now being dissolved because of this very hot water that's being heated by the magma. Now, obviously, you know, hot things rise more so than cold things. So it rises back to the ocean, which is here. So here's the bottom of our ocean. And then when it gets back into the ocean, it cools, right? Because the, cold, the water is cold and it's moving away from this magma. So the water is cold and some of the salts and things uh, actually precipitate out because they, they're not soluble anymore because it's too cold. So they precipitate out and form sulfide deposits. But the other ones that don't precipitate out just add to the concentration of seawater. Okay? So that's how hydrothermal vents work. Okay? So that concludes today's lesson on the ocean as an electrolyte. So we looked at what is actually the composition of the ocean and where do these ions actually come from. Okay? So we'll move on to the question segment now. So the concentration of chloride ions in the ocean is 0.55 moles per liter. Calculate the concentration of chloride ions in as a percentage of weight, for vo weight per volume. So we know this is true, okay? Uh, 0.55 moles per liter is what we've got. And we're going to convert that into a weight per volume as a percentage in a moment. So first we turn the moles into a gram, because weight is measured in grams. Uh, really mass, it should be mass per volume, but anyway. Uh, that's the physics person in me. So you have 0.55 moles, and we're going to multiply by the molar mass of chloride, which is 35.5 grams. So you can look that up in your periodic table, and you can check for yourself. But that's the molar mass of chloride, or chlorine. And we get 19.4975 grams per liter. So in a liter of salt water, the, you get 19.4, oh, okay, let's say 19.5 grams 
of chloride ions. Now, if we want to take that into a percentage, remember that you know there's sort of one gram of water per milliliter. So we take we divide by 100 and oh sorry by 10, and we get 1.94975 1. say almost two grams per 100 mils, and so that gives us a percentage of 1.95 percent. Okay. So the concentration of magnesium ions in the ocean is 0.053 moles per liter. Magnesium can be obtained from ocean water by, precip by precipitating magnesium hydroxide, converting it to magnesium chloride with hydrochloric acid, and then electrolyzing it um, using uh, electrolyzing the molten dry salt. Okay, so you precipitate it, then you convert it to magnesium chloride, then you melt it, and then electrolyze it. Now, what would be the ma maximum mass of magnesium that would be obtained from two? Or from 2,500 liters of ocean water. Okay, the maximum mass. So, if you are reading this question in an exam, you should recognize instantly one thing, and the word is maximum. And if it's maximum, then what that does is it simplifies your problem because that means that this section from Magnesium from this word magnesium to here is completely irrelevant. Okay, it's just thrown in there to confuse you, um, so that you don't actually follow the the solution process properly. So this whole section is irrelevant because it doesn't tell you anything about the maximum mass. It just tells you all the processes that go into it. There would be inefficiencies in each of these processes, but we're not talking about inefficiencies here. We're talking about maximum or the best assuming that everything was theoretically perfect. So how do we work it out then? So first we convert the grams per liter, uh, the moles per liter to grams per liter. So here we have moles per liter. We need to convert to grams. So the mass of magnesium per liter is equal to the concentration times the molar mass of magnesium. And so we have the concentration times the molar mass, and we could work that out from our periodic table. And then we get 1.28 grams per liter. Then all we have to do is multiply the by the volume of water that we have, and that gives us the mass. So mass of magnesium per liter times the volume gives you this, which is 3,221 grams. Okay. So you really didn't need any of this extra reaction stuff. It was just there to kind of throw you off when the solution was quite simple because the word was maximum. Okay. Or you could say it's about 3.2 kilos also. So question three is leaching is a natural process. However, it's being amplified by human activity. Explain how human activity has been increasing the leaching of salt ions into the water. So land clearing has increased the amount of salt ions leaching into seawater. That's our first statement. This is because by clearing land, water that falls on the soil is no longer absorbed by plants. As I mentioned before, the rain hits the soil, and sometimes the plants would absorb that rain before it can drag the salts down to the ocean. But, without, but by clearing the land, you're removing the plants, and you're removing what actually is absorbing the water. This allows the water that has collected ions to run into the ocean, and thus add ions to the seawater. Okay. Question 4. When water runs to the ocean bed after being heated by hyd hydrothermal vents, some of the ions crystallize out and settle on the ocean bed. Explain why this is so. So when the water is heated by the mantle, the high temperatures increase the solubility of, m of many of the chemicals. So remember, you know, high temperatures, you can dissolve more things. Um, low temperatures, obviously, you can't. This allows many chemicals in the rocks and the minerals to dissolve in the seawater. So when this ion-laden water it returns to the ocean floor, so after it leaves the, hydro th the, the heating process, the temperature drops and this reduction causes the solubility of the chemicals to decrease, forcing some chemical species to crystallize. So it would be like if you saturated a solution with, sea uh, with sugar when it was hot and then you cooled it, you'd notice that 
things would start crystallizing out because um, because suddenly it's become less soluble and so it becomes a solid again. So same, basically same process, yeah. So which of the following metals could be mined from mid-ocean ridges near hydrothermal vents? Magnesium, zinc, manganese, or calcium? And explain your answer. So zinc and manganese are likely to, de to be deposited near hydrothermal vents as their sulfides are insoluble in water while magnesium and calcium salts are much more soluble in ocean water, okay? So if you were to go looking for, you know, zinc or manganese deposits at the bottom of the ocean, saying you could, assuming that of course you could get there, you'd notice that the sulfides, the zinc and manganese sulfides are insoluble. So you could mine them out and take them away. Whereas magnesium sulfides and calcium salts are all soluble, well, mostly soluble in seawater. So you know, they'll get transported around and you wouldn't be able to mine them, so to speak. So that's why we can mine zinc and manganese, assuming we could find a concentrated enough deposit. So that concludes today's lesson on the ocean as the electrolyte. Um, we've looked at what the composition of the ocean is and how those salts actually get into the ocean in the first place. So I look forward to seeing you at our next lesson. Mm -hmm.